Marquetta Stapling Places. I am your host, Margaret Marquetta Novak Details. Thank you for joining us again today. We have another very, very interesting program with an unusual and charming guest. She is Minnie Wiesel, a second career mom, and we'll find out what that's all about who at age 43 left an exciting and lucrative career with Hughes Aircraft Company to enter the rabbinic seminary at the University of Judaism in Bel Air, California as a rabbinical, rabbinical <laughs> student. I am pleased to tell you that I have been friends with Mimi's family all of her life, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she was uh, a little infant. She didn't know me then, but she knew me later on when she could talk. Anyway, it's been a while, uh, at least 43 years, and um, it's been a, a really uh, very wonderful association um, with the family. Uh, yet, I would have never, ever guessed <laughs> or imagined that Mimi Wiesel would someday be entering the rabbinic, into the rabbinate, only because she comes from a very traditional Orthodox family, a large family. So here we are in 1994, where anything can happen with a woman who holds impressive credentials in the business world. Uh, she, I think she has an MBA from U USC. She, she received a bachelor's degree of arts at psychology at UCLA and um, a special, actually elementary and special education degree from Cal State mm -hmm. University, Northridge and Master of Business Administration from... Well, I took courses. Courses right. at Loyola right. Marymount University. And uh, as previous, previously really mentioned, she, she gave up all that to become a rabbinic student. And that's going to be our discussion for today. And we'll, we'll ask her what is exactly... I know she was doing some really interesting things and her job at Hughes. Mimi, welcome. It's Thanks wonderful for being to be here. here. Thank you for asking me. I know you're me. very busy. Well, it's, it's a delight. Won't your mom be surprised when she comes <laughs> back home. from St. Louis? Send her away. In a you're kidding. <laughs> what did you do? Not as much of a surprise as when I said I'm going to become a rabbi. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was one of the bigger shocks. Don't jump, don't jump <laughs> my show because this is, I, can't, I can't believe any of this. Um... What led you to, to this, I would have to say, calling? I mean, there has to be some inner there was there motivation that maybe you didn't even know I, about exactly. for a long time. I and didn't. it just was dormant and all of a sudden, pow. It, uh, how did it evolve? It evolved over many years of, as you say, I had this great job. It was very rewarding. It was challenging. It was interesting. I was involved in people. I mean, you were recruiting was, people for scholarships for a, I, an international. I worked. I traveled all over the country. I met professors and students and managers, and it was great. But there was always something what missing. Was your job description. My job description essentially was I managed educational programs and career development programs. I worked with engineering students. Mm -hmm. We, one of the programs we worked with, provided fellowships for them to get masters and doctorate degrees in engineering. Another program provided internships for undergraduates. Another one was a rotation program where the students moved from mm -hmm. different organizations to get a chance to really find the right job opportunity for them within the mm -hmm. company. I spent time counseling them. I worked with the managers doing training and motivational seminars. Oh I yeah, recruited. It was people, fun. How many people have these kind of uh, jobs? N not a very whole lot of us. <laughs> really? It's not the kind of thing you say when I'm a little girl. I want to grow up and be a career development person. <laughs> but and it travel was, around to yeah. high-level universities was, and interview yeah. brilliant and bright students right. for a huge aircraft. But I think that <laughs> that's part of what led me to realize that there was something missing in my life. They all had this, this passion for their field. They had a field that they knew in depth. They had 
something that, that motivated them. And I've always enjoyed working with people, and I had background in psychology and education, but I didn't have it, and I didn't know what it was. And I had So you felt that in your life you didn't have the kind of passion that these students had for their work. Partially that's it, right. I didn't have that, that focus. I didn't have the future vision of where was I going to be. Well, I engineers mean, are like that. They're right. structured. They map <laughs> Completely. out. Completely. Completely. I was married to one. Um, right. You know, yeah. my late husband was yeah. an engineer. And that's, they're very structured. Right. They, and they map out their whole life. That's correct. And, <laughs> and I, I you didn't the opposite. I let things kind of come to me. And I still do. So you never thought of becoming an engineer? No. No. Oh, I mean, okay. that wasn't my my interest. But I wasn't sure. I still didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I mean, I really was, was struggling with what happens and when my son goes off. A son. Right. And he was you're going a to be. Mom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I, I managed all of that. And I knew that he was leaving home because he was going off to college. And that was my How opportunity. Now, now he's, he's 19. Right. Last 19. time I saw you and him was at his bar mitzvah, which yeah. is six years ago. That's right. A long yeah. time. He's Have much taller now. Must be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I was on this journey and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do because as great as my job was it wasn't something that I wanted to necessarily do for another 25 years until it was time to retire mm -hmm. and I knew I wanted to go back to school and I explored different options and wasn't sure where I was going to end up and I you just don't go back to school and get a PhD just because you want to get a PhD you have to have purpose. a purpose and, and motivation you want to have something that you really want mm -hmm. to delve into mm -hmm. And I spent time talking to people in human resources and people in administration and universities and all kinds of things, and nothing clicked. It just mm -hmm. didn't talk to me. It just mm -hmm. wasn't quite right. And then about three years ago, in the local Jewish paper, the Jewish Journal, there was a cover uh, picture with a caption of a woman standing with her five children, and the caption was, Second Career Rabbi. And I went, that's it. Second career Second rabbi, career with, rabbi five children. with five children. She a local person? Yes, yes. And her oldest is now, I think, 15, and the youngest is still a little one. And, and, she, and she's she since become a rabbi? She's still in the middle of the program. She, uh -huh. I think, has two or three years to go. Yeah. So what do you do, contact her? I, well, the first thing I did was I got on the phone with one of my friends, and I said, I'm going to become a rabbi, expecting her to tell me you're out of your mind. But she said, it's perfect. It's great. It's just perfect? She okay. said, you can do it. And at that point, I, I had the answer. I had the calling, as you say. I mean, it was really, it put the pieces together. It, it in, took my working with people, my love of Judaism, my desire to, to study, and my traditional background that you mentioned. It put all of that together, and it, and it felt cohesive and right. At that point, I started making some phone calls. The first thing I did was call the University of Judaism to find out what, what does it mean? <laughs> how do you get into rabbinical school? What kind of background do you have to have? You know, how do you go about this whole process? And I went in and I spoke to the admissions director and we talked about what the process is and what it would involve. She referred me to a few of the rabbis on staff and I spoke to them. And I also went in and spoke to um, the people at, at Hebrew Union College, the Reform um, mm -hmm. Seminary, just to Make, make sure that I was make a comparison, mm -hmm. and I explored the different options. And of course, you would not be accepted at a at an orphanage. No, I have this minor. <laughs> You're the wrong gender. I'm a woman. <laughs> they wouldn't talk to me. So um, I'm gonna, gonna yeah. save the next question. <laughs> um, so I, the more I explored, the more apparent came. Uh, this is what I wanted to do. Okay, you did, did it. You made up your mind. This is what you're going to do. The next step, got to tell my family. Right. Well, actually, that wasn't <laughs> the next step because that was almost the last step. I mean, I had had spent a lot of time, as I said, talking to different people. I, I talked to lots of rabbis in the community. Mm -hmm. I went through the application process, which involved a lot of personal essays and, and questions that were 
I mean, been you, you were accepted. I was with accepted. no difficulty. Actually, you had you had pretty good. Right, good I took back Right, I had you know I had to take yeah, the right courses, the right courses, the right GRE classes. You know, whatever I needed to take, I did. Mm -hmm. And then it was it was time to tell my family to spill the beans. To spill the beans, and there were several issues. One was telling my son, who wouldn't have the same philosophical issues that right. the rest of my family would, but. What does this mean for him? To that him, I mean, what is his mom's going to be a rabbi? You know, she's just supposed to be mom, right. and it means next year I'll be going to Israel, and then after that I'll be finishing up in New York, and so we'll be separating. And I always assumed that he would go off to college. Meanwhile, he's decided to stay here in California, and I'm the one that's leaving. But <laughs> he so turned the tables. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. um, but he's he's been very supportive, and he's been very excited, kind of proud of mom, which has been great because it could oh, have been. Oh, yeah, for sure. In fact, last Hanukkah, he gave me uh, a Hanukkah gift, and I opened it up, and it was a license plate holder that said, Rabbi in training. So oh, that was that's really cute. cute. <laughs> so I knew it. He's, you know, I've got his, so his got that stamp of car. approval. <laughs> right, I do. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, then telling my mother and my, my siblings was, well, sorry, was hard. Your siblings are... Extremely, I mean, super, especially Helena and her mm -hmm. husband is super, super orthodox. Very orthodox. I mean, Hasidic. Yes, they are, and, and my other brother and sister are, are, are traditional close orthodox. To it, very right. traditional. Very traditional. Well, of course, Eva Gale and, mm -hmm. and her husband are right. modern orthodox. Right, mm -hmm. the, and Bernie, my brother, they're also they're modern orthodox. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, it's not so not foreign because I don't know our audience it knows exactly right differentiate right I mean it's very observant observing all the precepts but dress uh, right. in regular and clothes. involved in in modern day-to-day -day life in the business uh, world and the people community are not right not as much I mean they right. they have different views but they're still also very involved in in well, things that interest oh, well. them right that right. fall into their category right and so when I I told them they, there's this dead, when I spoke to my sisters, there's this dead silence on the phone. Um, and it was like, okay, if that's what you want to do. And, and I spoke to one of my brother-in-laws who objected based on philosophical Judaic reasons, which mm -hmm. was very hard for me to grapple with. Um, mm -hmm. And then I had to take a step back and, and see it from his point of from view. From his point of view, and then go through the logical process to to negate that and to come back to where I'm coming from, which is seeing Judaism as an evolving, changing process within the structure of the law. And so you, you would have no problem putting on, uh, I mean, as a rabbi, uh, do, do female w women rabbis wear, I don't know how many there are, do they wear a tallit, a prayer mm -hmm, shawl? Mm -hmm. yes. And what, you wear a, One a, is a, a, a cap? A, a not necessarily the, it, it, in the different movements it's well, different I'm, ta I'm right. not talking about reform right, okay. in I the mean, conservative, conservative movement there are currently approximately 50 women rabbis uh -huh. the, the seminary has required that the women take on the obligations that are required of men women rabbis or have are obligated to take on that obligation that they men don't have the choice it's imposed on them women can choose to take on these obligations typically the women are not obligated to them because they're time-bound commandments and the woman is seen as as having other obligations such as taking care of children and family that would impede her being able to to do both well to do the obligations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to raise her family but taking on the title of rabbi, the seminary, and the rabbinical association of the rabbinical assembly of the conservative movement has required that women take on these obligations, which means wearing a talit, means the prayer shawl, which means praying three times a day. Oh, what do you wear? A robe or just regular? Just dress? regular clothes, regular mm -hmm. regular dress, mm -hmm. um, but with the the religious accoutrements that that mm -hmm. are are required. So women rabbis are able to marry people and they carry do everything. out all the and do the have congr yes, congregations? They, are they heads of congregations? They're too, heads of congregations. They're still breaking their way through to larger congregations. Um, and not in the, in the city here? Here in Los Angeles, Rabbi Naomi Levy is 
Oh, she's a in rabbi. Venice. She's in Venice. It makes I went to a Sheila. wedding where she, mm -hmm. you know her? Yes, yes. In fact, I she, kind of consider her a mentor. She married somebody I know. Yeah, she, she does I, a wonderful job. I didn't job. meet her. Mm -hmm. she's, she's very warm and gracious, very bright, very committed to her Judaism, and she's brought, been able to, to teach a lot of people many wonderful things about Judaism. Her congregation is growing. She was one of the first women to actually have her own congregation, congregation. Uh -huh. so she's really paving the well, way. Well, now there's big news is Laura With Geller Brock, right. for the reform uh, taking over the Temple Emanuel in Correct. Beverly Hills. Correct. She's the first woman the rabbi to take over a, big a, ver a very large congregation. Right. I think it has that's over 800 right. families. That's, but that's in the reform Correct. movement. Correct. Right. But, but she's been quite well known in other areas, although as a rabbi, but not a pulpit rabbi. Right. She's had experience in Hillel work. Mm -hmm. on college campuses. She was at USC for many years, and then recently she was working with um, the American Jewish Congress. Yeah, like yeah. and so now But it's making big news. Big news, because I mean, it's headlines everywhere. The same as, as, as a woman in, in corporate America breaking through the glass ceiling. I mean, she's really made a mark. This is, it's not easy for most rabbis to, to get a mm -hmm. congregation that size, and for a woman, yeah. the reform have, have been ordaining women for about 25 years. So, so they have a lot long. of uh, female rabbis? They have about, I think it's about 200. So, so, the, so there's 50 in the conservative movement, 200 in the reform right. movement. Okay, you did it. You told everybody and all that. Now <laughs> comes the financial responsibility. Mm -hmm. What, you sold your condo and you moved in with your mom? I did. After <laughs> how many years? Right. Like, you were uh, out of the Many house, years. 25 I mean. years? <laughs> at least. Yeah, at least. least. <laughs> right. Um, I was... I was really lucky because as my mom, the, my mother's concern was not so much the, the theological issues of my becoming a rabbi, but I was giving up my pension plan. And she was very gracious and she's very loving and very generous. Well, yeah. And she, you know, and um, she said, would you like to come live here? Which was great. Um, it, in a lot of ways, it's been wonderful because we've been able to, to live together in a way that, that most people don't. After you've you've raised your own family, right, she's still vibrant and enjoying well, and filled with life, and we get to have a new marvelous, relationship. Marvelous example. It's a wonderful experience. You know, it's a, it's it's something rare, I would yeah. say. And uh, most people don't get the you chance. You could to lecture on that issue in itself. Alone, alone, right? Where right. The the uh, theme or whatever the 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 mm -hmm. moda or mm -hmm. whatever has been people, everybody living alone. Living alone, or if you come back when you're 25, you still have a lot of growing up mat maturation right. issues. You really we don't have those, and, and fortunately my mother, thank she goodness, has her is, own, she has her she own life, her own and she's not coming, we're not living together because she's now dependent on me. Mm -hmm. um, we're both very independent, and mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful opportunity. So and now Michael stays. And now my son too. is back with us, too, so we have three generations so coming and going. So how time. do you manage financial? I mean, still, even though you sold your condo, right. no, I mean, there's a <laughs> lot of years ahead of right. uh, it's, no it's, income. It's a financial, well, part-time work. I've been working. I've been teaching um, in religious schools. I te teach this year fifth grade and second grade. Last year I was also working with seventh grade, so I've gone back to a, a much earlier career when I used to be in education, and now I'm in using that with my, my new knowledge, that my more in-depth knowledge of Judaism. I'm do also... Do your students know that you're a yes, student? Yes, yes. What, what do they think of that? They think it's great. They think mm -hmm. it's fine. They don't think about it as much as right. I'm a woman being a rabbi, and to them... Well, and, uh, any adults were all the same age. Right. They, were, they were born they're into, more this, familiar with into this era. Right. And not so from another era. Which is nice because mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have as many issues for them, and hopefully we're setting models. What for about them. your larger family? You know, your father had a lot of cousins. Yeah. And they're your been aunts tremendously and supportive. Really? Oh, amazing. In fact, I'm watching some of their evolution. My aunt that, that you mentioned. When I told them, I told my aunt that I was going to become a, a rabbi, and it was like, okay, but I don't agree that women should be rabbis. Then, unfortunately, her brother, my uncle, was very ill. She was visiting him up at Stanford University when he was in the hospital. Chaplain came in and asked if she'd like to see a rabbi to talk to, and she mm -hmm. said yes. A little while later, in walks the rabbi, who was a woman. Really? Mm-hmm. Um, and... 
she found that having a woman in that capacity of chaplain for her as a woman opened up a whole new level of communication and comfort that she wasn't able to ever find well, in experiences with a man. this was her third brother. Right. She or, lost. What is your father right. who died? And her father. How old mm -hmm. was your father? 40? 50. He was 50. 50. He just turned 50. And then his brother Bill, and mm -hmm. now and now Hunt. Right. So, right. And she was that able had to, be to relate. Horrible. But it was wonderful for her to relate as, as a woman, mm -hmm. and she never had that opportunity. She says, I'm still not sure if I'm comfortable with a woman being on the pulpit. Right. But just whatever those barriers are that are breaking down. And this is a woman who's lived a full, complete life. And she's now being able to see, and she's, she's taking on some new things herself. She said that on the holiday of Simchat Torah, she was held the Torah herself. Did and she, she? marched around. And she just, well, that she's just thrilled. She's thrilled. Malvina just, Yes. So it's and very exciting. So we're all making slow steps. Okay, other than moving in with your mom and all that, what, what other... Uh, are there significant adjustments? Well, for you? going back to school is a mm -hmm. huge adjustment, um, but I love it. Um, a what, whole. Well, what kind of friends that can you maintain? That's I mean, that that's, that's that's whole, it, are you are men threatened by? Uh, um, in school, the, the people have been tremendous. I mean, I'm now friends with people who I'm old enough to be their mother, but we have so much in common, and we're on the same spiritual well, journey and quest, and, and I respect them. I yeah. have so much to learn from them that, that mm -hmm. it's tremendous. And, and what I see that's wonderful is the energy and, and the brilliance and the commitment and the passion that they have that they're bringing to the Jewish community as leaders, and I think that it's very hopeful and encouraging. Men haven't particularly been threatened that I've come in contact with. Most people have been interested, and I I was not sure how people that I didn't know like in the Orthodox community would react. They've been very supportive and understanding. Often mm -hmm. I found that, that there are women that might be in positions like mm -hmm. in the conservative reform mm -hmm. movement and they have a little bit more trouble with it, which I can't really? figure out. I haven't been able... Why is that? I don't know. I, but it's been interesting to see the reaction. Mm -hmm. But um, most people have been very supportive. They People will react when because people... It relates to their, your experience right. from their experience, and I'll tell them what I'm doing, and they'll say, that's great, you but know, that's not I, what I want to do. <laughs> about uh, 12, 14 years ago, my aunt, two of them just passed away recently, were living in Murrieta Hot Springs, mm -hmm. and I went there to stay with them over the weekend or some Shabbat, and I went to the synagogue with them. And, you know, I like to sing the prayers. Mm -hmm. And I guess they... <laughs> They heard me up front, <laughs> and so this man came over. We don't sing quite so loud. Oh no! <laughs> he invited me. I should come and lead the congregation. Oh, that's wonderful! And Did I you do it? I should, no, <laughs> <laughs> I I couldn't do that at all. And it, it was really interesting. So, why is it well, there are women rabbis now? I said, no, I, it's, it's I still maintain. I I maintain the traditional, yeah. and it's a very you know, personal. Yeah, you have expression. To feel, if mm -hmm. you feel comfortable doing it, right. that's great. Right. Um, well, so actually, uh, you're you are at inner peace with yourself, mm -hmm. and now actually, that when you are that happy and you're looking forward to what you're going to be doing, then that's the best kind of uh, job right. you're going to be doing Absolutely. because you're really, really thrilled in doing it. And right. <laughs> and the nice thing time about of life when you should know what you're doing. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I think the nice thing too that one of I remember when I was thinking about this process is when somebody said to me, as a rabbi, you don't ever have to retire. So it's something that can be it will fill up my life. So spiritually and emotionally, you are you are you feel that you're being fulfilled mm -hmm. um, and and definitely uh, intellectually challenged. Well, it's <laughs> hard work. I can very hard work. It's so very how much work. time do you have left? Two years. No, I have a year in Israel and then three more after that in New York. So I have another four years. That's a long, That's a long time. Right. So right. what are your prospects after that? After that, we'll see. Um, mm -hmm. There is a shortage of, of rabbis so that I know there'll be there job is. opportunities. Mm -hmm. Why so is in that? The, in the conservative movement, there Not enough are money for men. Well, there, there, it, it isn't necessarily a high-paying 
mm -hmm. career. Um, and you have to deal with people. You have to deal with people. It can Not everybody's be, cut out for it. And it can be a 24-hour-a-day job, mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on what you choose and to do. And you're prepared. You think you're prepared to do that. I think that there's ways of, of balancing that. I think wow. that's one of the things that bringing women into the profession well, will bring a, a mediation. And I think some of the younger people that I'm, that I'm going to school with wow. are able to set priorities differently. They're going to want to be with their young families. And, and, and they're going to have to And my priority now it. is to stop Mimi because okay. they flag me down. <laughs> they're going to cut me <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> See you, Wazel. Rabbinic you, student, Margaret. second thanks career good. mom. Thanks for being here. And I never got to tell the story how I met your dad. He liberated me on April 15, 1945 from a concentration camp in Germany. He was in the army. Thank you for watching us. Uh, time has flown by and if you uh, like your comments, look over the credits, how to get in touch with me. If you'd like to know more about Mimi Weisel, then maybe she can get in touch with you through me. Until next time, God bless. I'm Margaret Marquetta Nova Dekel. So long.